All right. So as some of you might know, um, last Friday, my dog died. And so this weekend kind of sucked. But I wanted to first and foremost thank out thank everybody who reached out and sent me a lot of love. I got a lot of love this weekend from people who didn't even know the dog. But, you know, it was it was nice. I appreciate appreciate all the messages. I am kind of a I'm a I'm a very much a suffer in silence type of person, suffer in silence. So I keep my emotions very much to myself when it comes to stuff like that. So I didn't really answer <laughs> anybody. And so I just kind of did my, my own thing throughout the weekend. I just want to be by myself. But I did appreciate, you know, everybody reaching out. And so I decided, you know what? I, I don't think I've talked about her that much on this podcast. So I figured, you know, I'll, I'll share our story. And it's not just because I'm sad and stuff like that. And and I want to get attention to myself. No, it's actually because it's, I believe it's an interesting story. It was fun. It was fun for me. But then again, I lived it. So I'm kind of biased. But I thought it was fun living it. And so I figured I'd share it. And it's what's on my mind. So, and it's my show. So I can do whatever I want. Anyway, uh, let me tell you a little bit about her. First off, her name is Shelby. She was over 10 years old. Uh, American Akita, white. If you want to see a picture of her, I loaded it on my Instagram. You can check it out there. Uh, at, at the Dario the Show one, that's when the one you can find her on, on our fa- or on my Facebook page, Super Dario World. Um, yeah, American Akita. She was, for those of you who don't know what that breed is, it's it's a bigger dog. Kind of looked like, she kind of looked like a white wolf, but a curled up tail, triangle ears. Really, really beautiful dog. Um, she was about 70 pounds. So she was, she was a big girl. She she had a lot of hair. <laughs> uh, uh, for pretty much every single day that I had her, I, I woke up with dog hair in my mouth. And I had dog hair everywhere. It didn't matter. Worth every second. But uh, she was the best dog I ever had. Um, you know, the one that says the standard, the special one, the one. That's she was that for me. Um, and I know that everybody thinks that their dog is special. <laughs> I mean, she was special to me. Like she was perfect for me. And so, um. It's actually funny because I've, you know, I've, I've had a lot of pets throughout my life. I've had a lot of dogs throughout my life. And there was something about this one. Dogs in many ways are like people, you know. Some are good ones. Some are bad ones. And some of them are special. This one was a special dog. And it wasn't the breed. It wasn't the way I raised her. It was It was her. Like, she was special. And we understood each other in a way that, it, you know. I never understood myself with uh, any other living being. It was it was very interesting. Uh, so, personality. She was a a bit of a sundere. <laughs> For those of you who don't know what a sundere is, let me let me try to find the exact definition. But it's it's an archetype of an of anime characters. So basically, it means. The, you know, the characters kind of mean in the beginning, kind of too cool for school and kind of hate you a little bit in the beginning. But uh, and when she warms up to you, she's like very fierce, very devoted and stuff like that, but still thinks she's too cool for school. <laughs> that that was her to a T. Like, in fact, if, I'm going to I'm probably going to load a, a picture of her. That's the first time. Well, the, the first day I had her and you can just see it in her face. Her face is like, I'm over this human. Put me down. <laughs> it's great. Um, and so. Well, I, I'll I, I'll go back to to that day in in a minute. But the thing that to me the thing that made her special for a dog, not just special for me, like for a dog in general, is she was extremely smart. And I'm not the smartest dog in the world, definitely. But uh, at least it's it's funny, you know. Human supposedly dogs, and here's a fun fact about dogs: the the animal that has the social part of their brain that cl- most closely relates humans is actually dogs. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. Like, more than primates. It, and it makes a lot of sense because dogs evolved with us. That They used to be wolves, and they evolved to dogs. And so it makes sense that some of the things that they evolved were because of us. They evolved with us, and they've been looking at us, staring at us for generations. And so we are social beings. They're, social, they're pack animals, too. So it makes sense that the social part of their brain is clo- more closely related to us. And I'll give you a perfect example of that. Um... We, humans do something that no other animal does in the animal kingdom, and that's we point. And so when we point at something, we understand that I don't want you to look at my finger, which is when, like if like even monkeys don't really understand the concept of pointing. It takes a really long time for them to get it. But if but if you point somewhere with a monkey, the monkey will be looking at your hand, at your finger. You don't want them to look at your finger. You want them to look at the direction that you're pointing at, right? That's That's something that we humans do. It's natural. 
And dogs are the animals that most easily understand this. In fact, most dogs will understand the concept of pointing without you even realizing it. You don't have to train a dog to understand pointing. It'll do it naturally, eventually, like just the same as humans. Like we humans eventually understand the same thing by by ourselves. Dogs do the same thing. The only animal that actually does that naturally, or you know, after hanging out a little bit with humans, but but they get it. No other animal actually gets this concept. Well, they do. Cats are starting to do that because we started socializing more with cats. Primates, you can train them for it, but they do it naturally. And so our brains are very similar. And so, well, not the social part of our brains. And I, I think I've talked about this before. I talked about it with my brother was here on the podcast about when you go to certain places, um, there's a lot of body cues. Uh, even if you don't speak a language, you can still communicate with people, even if you're, if you're in a different country. And I've done this. And it's because you... We have body cues and we can understand each other. And to me, Shelby is like the closest thing I've ever seen to a dog talking. Like through our own little third language that we created with each other. Like the same that you do when you when you go to a foreign country, you kind of make up a way to understand each other. That's kind of what we do. And I know that a lot of people do that with their pets. Like that's a common thing. But I mean that a, a random person could show show up to the house and they'd be like, okay, this this they could understand what she was expressing. It was truly a thing to see she was very special she made an impression actually she made an impression on people uh so a lot of people actually reached out and they were telling me you know about how much they, they they cared about the dog they remember my dog even if they only went like people who i hadn't talked to in years or that i that our relationships did not end that well they reached out you know it's it's it was it was weird but it was you know it's it's heartwarming to see that she made that type of impact you know and so um, this actually started off pretty early, and that's the story that I want to tell, the story of how she first came to my house. And so this this will have to harken back quite a few years, a decade, a decade all the way back. And uh, back at this time, I was, what, in my 20s? I was, I was about 20, 21, and uh, I was living in Guadalajara. Now, after after graduating, graduating high school, I I guess it depends how you want to see it. A lot of people look at it as that I wasted a lot of time because <laughs> I should have what I should have done, honestly, right straight out of high school. I, sh- I should have because I, I went to school down in Mexico. I, I did my high school in Mexico. And what I should have done is I should have immediately crossed over to the U.S., gone to community, community college over there and then transferred to SDSU and then graduated there. And it would have been done very, very early, in my early 20s. I did not do that. That's what I should have done. What I ended up doing is I decided, you know what, I want to go to Guadalajara because earlier in in my life, when I was like like fifteen years old, years old, I went to a to a sports tournament to participate in a sports tournament in Guadalajara, and I fell in love with the, I, I fell in love with the city. I love the the culture, the people, the food, the women who are extremely gorgeous, and uh, yeah, that was that. And I was like, all right, okay, I want to keep studying there. Plus, I the, a school that I went to there to to visit, they had one of the best media programs out there communications and i was like you know what all right that's that's where i want to go it's every single thing is telling me that i should go there the signs are pointing in that direction um and uh and so i i transferred there well i didn't transfer i went there after a year i got a job for uh for a for they were they were shooting a pilot a pilot for a reality tv show some americans came down here and i got a job for them because they needed a translator and i was supposed to just be the sound the sound assistant, but I ended up the sound guy left, but he left the equipment, so I ended up being the sound operator. That's actually how I started working on sound. Uh, they just threw me straight in the fire, and then the assistant direct, and then the uh, nobody else really, you know, between the crew and the direct, the director and the producer and the, and the talent, they only spoke English. Nobody else really spoke it that well, except the Mexican producer, and he wasn't there the whole time. So I, I basically had to translate everything for everybody. And the assistant director left, so I was also kind of the assistant director. And the assistant producer left, so I was also a pr- uh, assistant producer there. So I did a whole bunch of stuff or a whole bunch of hats, and uh, it was a hectic week. I barely slept, and I loved it. I fell in love with it. I was like, all right, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to work in, in this industry. It seems crazy. Uh, and at that point, film school opened up in Tijuana, which is where I grew up. Also, a big factor, the reason why I wanted to leave Tijuana is because Tijuana wasn't really that safe at that point. And so it's like, oh, look, this city where I can actually go out and be safe. Cool. Um, but I decided, all right, they opened up film school over there. Why Why am I wasting time doing communications over here if I could just go straight to film? And also, it's closer to home. 
well, it's actually at home. So it's like, all right, okay, I'll do that. So I went back there. Things did not really go that well for me in that school. I, I have an issue. I have a very serious issue that I, I figure things out kind of quickly and then I get bored. And so when when I school, I've always had the, the issue that once I figure out with the professor or the grading system or how I can get away with stuff, I tend to do so. So most most of the time I'm a terrible student. I just I'm the guy who's asleep in class. But most professors don't will hate me the first few months because like, God, oh, this is the kid who's always asleep in class and then tests come in or projects come in and I hand them in and, and it's great. And they're like, oh, okay, well, this is the guy who falls asleep in his class, but I don't have to worry about him because he, he hands them in. So uh, it wasn't great because I don't I don't mind uh, wasting time. What I don't mind wondering. Like, one of my favorite expressions of all time is not all not all who wonder are lost. I, I really believe that. So as long as you're learning something, you're having experience, you, you, you're having you're getting something of value. There's nothing wrong with wondering. I love wondering. I love exploring different things. I like trying things out. I like making mistakes. I love it. It, it I, I feel like it's one of my favorite things to do. I feel like it's the things that made me grow the most. And so at this point, I was like, I'm not, I'm, I don't feel like I'm learning. I feel like I'm just there wasting my time. So I started, you know, avoiding classes and still, you know, getting, still passing. So I figured out that, you know, I, I don't even have to go to school and I'm passing. So I don't want to go to school just for, you know, for a diploma, I want to go to learn. Otherwise, what's the point? So I decided, you know what, I'll, I'll take this back. Because the problem is that they just opened up the school. So I was the first generation and we were the guinea pigs. So And what I've talked to from the second generation people is that, okay, the, they were starting to kind of figure it out a little bit. So I decided, you know what, I'll just, I'll skip a semester. And uh, then I'll, in the meantime, I'm going to try to get a job with some of the contacts that I have down in Guadalajara. And then I'll just come back. So I returned to Guadalajara. And I was there for, for a few months. I was trying to get a job. Oh, I was trying to, to do a whole... At the same time, I was, you know, still sneaking into the school library because they had a kick-ass library for media stuff. And I was basically studying there for free. I joined some of my, my friends for classes because since I was a former student there, I think I still had my my credentials. So I could still sneak in and stuff like that. So... um. I, I I was still learning. I was still enjoying that bit of it, but I uh, I was very very much trying to get work. You know, I'm, I'm a person who has work. Now during my first in well my first year in Guadalajara, um, I I lived in an apartment. I had two roommates who were never there, and by never there I mean what well, one uh, he was in. He, he was a doctor, and so he would spend most of his time in the hospital. And weekends, he they both of them lived near near a very small town in Guadalajara, and so they um, they they le- and they had girlfriends back there. So they left every single weekend, and one wasn't there for most of the week. So I was I was there alone a lot, like a, a lot, and I wasn't used to that. I've, every single every single since I, I was I I don't even remember how how little I was, but we've always had pets in the house. I've have have way too many siblings, and so there, I was like, I, I I like having people, or I, I like having living things, and so I started looking into maybe getting a dog while I was there because I, I wanted a pet, I wanted company, I wanted I wanted something to join me, and so I started doing some research. And uh, first off, I was like, all right, what kind of dog am I gonna get? It's gonna be a little dog. No, I don't want a little dog. I'm not a, I I'm not the biggest fan of little dogs. Like I've had little dogs, and they were great. I had a, a mini poodle, Oliver. He was great. Loved him. But I wanted a big dog because there was a park right across the street from my house and I could never go out running or anything because there were like other big dogs there mean who were mean dogs. And it's like, all right, okay, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna get a dog, I'm gonna get a big dog. So that'll she'll walk or he'll watch my back. So I started doing some research and I read this I was trying to find big dogs who could also live in apartments, stuff like that, and that's when I came into the Akitas and I read the story of of Hachi. If you've seen the movie Hachi, you probably know the story of this dog whose owner, he walked with his owner every single day to the train. And then one day the train, the owner died at work. And so the dog was there waiting for him to come back. And every single day the dog would keep coming back. And so they built a statue for the dog. Uh, and it just shows you that it's, first off, it's a great breed. Uh, they're extremely loyal. They prefer humans over other dogs. They bred them to actually hunt bears. So they'll, they'll, they'll defend you against a fucking bear. And I was like, that's the dog that I fucking want, man. That sounds great. The, the only downside is that they, they shed too much. And uh, they they kind of don't like other dogs. 
but it's uh they prefer, they prefer humans over dogs basically and uh and to me it's like oh the shedding is not that bad all you have to do is you take care of that sounds like a me thing like if i take care of the hair it shouldn't be an issue even if you take care of the hair it's an issue it's it's a lot of hair but worth it anyway so i looked and there was a breeder in the area who's actually kind of like a famous breeder and stuff like that and it was just let's say out of my price range and i decided that i that was i was at that point where i decided all right i'm gonna go back to tijuana and so it's like all right okay i let that that uh the little thing the little dream go push forward a few uh a year that's when i came back to guadalajara and i helped out a friend while while i was there one of the projects that i got to work on is a friend of mine she for for the school project they needed to to do a to record a short film and so she had a lot of money and so she rented out a whole production a whole production truck of equipment that they did not know how to use (laughs) and so she asked me to help out and so i did i I, to me it was great i got experience i got to use some stuff that i never used before and it was a huge pain in the butt but i love doing it so um i I went there to, to to help her out it was great and so she wanted to pay me and and i told her dude no i mean i'm not gonna take money like this was actually like good for me uh, you you did me a solid i'm good i don't need anything at the same time that this was going on um it turns out that her family they were friends with the owners of of the breeder the, of the breeder that i told you before and uh their ranch where they had their dogs they it got flooded and so they had to put the dogs somewhere and so the dad lent lent them out their property well one of their properties to be like yeah you can just keep them there it's fine and because the rains are pretty gnarly down Guadalajara, like they, they get pretty gnarly. And so, especially compared to San Diego or Tijuana, but they get really gnarly. And so it's like, oh, okay, keep the dogs. And the breeder was like, okay, well, what can I pay you with? Like, how much do I have to pay you for stuff like that? The dad was like, don't worry about it. We're friends. Don't worry. It's like, all right, okay. Well, we just had like this fresh batch of puppies. Feel free to take one if you want. And he was like, well, I don't really want a dog. So he asked his daughters. And the daughters were like, well, we don't really need a dog right now. But she had heard, well, first off, it's known that I like pets. I love dogs. And uh, she had, she she asked another mutual friend that we have, like, dude, um, do you think Dario wanted this dog? And this, this was my best friend over there. And it's like, all right, well, what was the breed? And one of the breeds was the uh, an option was the, the Amer- American Akita. And he was like, oh, fuck yeah. He's going to fucking love. <laughs> Are you kidding me? And so... I drove a truck back. I still have the truck, but back then I drove a truck and, uh, I, now I don't drive it. I have another car, but I still, ha- I still have the truck. It's, it was, a uh, actually fate threw that truck in my way as well back then. Maybe one day I'll talk about the truck, but, uh, but, uh, she asked me like, Hey, I'm, I'm trying to, I, I need to move something. And could you help me out with your truck? I was like, sure. I'll help you out. Uh, we load some furniture onto the truck and we go over to the sprint to the, to this, property where where they had all the dogs and we go in there's like oh my god look at all these dogs it's great and he's like oh you like them like yeah are you kidding me like are those the americans like yeah do you like them yeah you can keep one and i was like (laughs) what (laughs) he's like yeah no and she explained the situation and i was like are you sure like yeah just pick one and so what the what the owners did at that point was they had lined up because i I mentioned like can i see the like the Akita, the American Akitas, because the, they didn't have the Japanese Akitas, they had the American Akitas. Basically, the difference between an American Akita and a Japanese Akita is the American Akitas are slightly bigger because they bred them for dog fighting. So they really don't like other dogs. <laughs> they're they're bred to dislike other dogs and bears, and they're slightly bigger than the Akitas, but for the most part, they're fairly similar in temperament and stuff like that. And so they uh, they they. They were like, all right, okay, sure. Well, let me just like let me just get the dogs. And so they lined them up. It was like eight puppies all lined up. And at that point, I'm I'm not sure what the hell's going on, what I want, blah, blah. I'm not, you know, it's you you're you're trying to just like, is this real? Like, is it is this real that I'm actually going to get the dog that I wanted that I researched years ago? Like, how the hell did this happen? But uh it was happening and I got all I, I got all these dogs in a row. And uh, I'm looking at them. Some that they, they were there was a beautiful like white male. There was one with a mask. There were some other like very pretty, 
very pretty females. And I was like, God, oh, do you want a male? Do you want a female? And at the very end uh, was the run of the litter. A beautiful little white thing, female, uh, with just, she was mostly white, but she had a little bit of gold in her ears and just a slightly little bit of gold in her forehead. And so the, they were all lying down and I'm looking at them like, oh, which one do I want? Which one do I want? And so while, while I'm trying to decide, they put a bowl of food at the opposite end of the run. So let's say the, the run of the litter was all the way at the right. They put a f- bowl of food all the way at the left. All right. And so she notices this. She like she gets her head up, notices the food, gets up. And instead of going in front of everybody or behind everybody, she starts walking over the heads of every single one of her siblings. And then when she reaches the bowl, she's just sitting there on the head of the last two on the hands of the last two ones while she's eating. <laughs> I saw that and I was like, that one, <laughs> that one right there. <laughs> it's like, are you sure? Like, yes, yes. She's that's the perfect attitude. That's that's that dog's got personality. That one. And so that's the first time I laid eyes on her. And it was, to me, it was love at first sight. You know, it's like, I saw her do that. It's like, yes, that's that's the one. So she was four weeks old at this point. And uh, very, very, I, I had to separate her. Well, we, we had to separate her from her mom pretty young because in a couple of weeks, I was driving from Guadalajara, Mexico to Monterrey, Mexico to pick up my sister. Because my sister, she was studying in Monterrey. And uh, it was, it was December break. It was winter break. And it was like, all right, okay, I'll stop by, pick you up when you finish finals. I also have some friends in Monterey. So I was like, right, I'm going to visit my friends too. And then I'll, I'll pick you up. We'll pick up some of your furniture and stuff. Cause she was also, she was moving from there too. Uh, she was moving somewhere else and we were getting rid of some furniture. And then we'll drive back together through the States, through the whole of Texas, back to San Diego. And so it's a, uh, just to, to give you an idea from, from Guadalajara to Monterey is about a 10 hour drive. It's 791 kilometers. So roughly, roughly 400 miles. And I was planning on doing that with a six, seven week old puppy. It, it's not a smart idea, but I got the dog of my dreams and I wasn't, you know, gonna, and I wasn't gonna take any chances. Now, ideally, you should not separate a dog from their mother until they're at least eight weeks old, because that way, uh, the mom in that period they they teach her about hygiene, hygiene stuff, and a little, a few social things, and like don't pee on your bed and stuff like that. But uh, I had to because I I had a few weeks to get ready, and I basically for the ne- for the next few weeks I spent the majority of my time just staring at her, <laughs> and <laughs> trying to learn all her cues and fortunately it was extremely easy now i guess for this point i need to explain how a dog's brain work and a little bit of the, their biology if you've ever had dogs maybe you maybe this is new information for you maybe it's not either way i'm going to share it so the the story is complete so the way that a dog works their brains don't fully develop until they're six months old so literally nothing that that you do before that they'll remember like that's why you shouldn't even bother like spanking them or something before that cuz they won't remember it. However, you can develop a trauma in their brain. Now for those of you who don't know, traumas actually have are physical manifestation in your brain. It's not just like memories that are kind of uh, like electric impulses. There, there's it's a fa- actual like piece like trauma is an actual thing that you can see on your brain on a scan. And so you can develop traumas in puppies and they won't even know what the hell we we had another dog who Every single time my brother approached them, he just wet himself. And uh, we figured it's probably because my, my brother was the only smoker in the house. And it probably, at some point in his past, somebody who's, who who was a smoker uh, like abused him or something. Or at least kicked him once or hit him with a broom. Because he, also, he also did not want, want to even look at brooms in, in a picture or something. Like not even hear the word brooms. But, um, and so we figured somebody who, who was a smoker did something to him. And uh, even my brother was really kind to him. He was really nice. He's, he was he's great with dogs, but uh, this every single time he approached them, peed himself. And this also comes into something else. So so basically, dog's brain nothing nothing stays there for for most dogs before six months. And so it's up to the owner to make sure that mistakes don't happen. So like accidents. So the best way to make sure your dog doesn't have an accident is 
after they eat, after they sleep, after they play, immediately take them out to pee, to, to go to the restroom every single time. Because some of the last muscles to develop, the, the, some of the last muscles the dog develops are the ones that help them hold, hold in their pee. So again, they have no control of it when they're little. When they want, when they got to go, they just go. So it's up to you to make sure that you understand their cues already. And if you want to play it safe, just every single time after they eat, after they sleep, after they play, take them out to pee every single time. And so I was really focusing on all this stuff with her because we were going to be, again, 10 hours locked in a car. And it is it was a single cab Toyota Tacoma, tiny car. Um accidents there would really suck and so I spent a lot of time trying to you know just get a, get acquainted with her cues and at the same time I would took I would take her out for for little drives around to make sure that she would get used to being in the car with me um also at that no so and so since I'm trying to you know ever again you take her out to pee every single time after eating after playing after all that stuff the first time I took her out was pretty interesting um I, I put a you know like a like a chain collar on her and I walk her out and 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 uh, you know I carry her outside just so it's easier. I put her down, start walking, and I feel like a resistance. You know, so and I turn around and she's just sitting there. So I'm like you know I'm trying to like nudge her over and she's defiantly standing there just looking at me, and I'm like this little bitch, <laughs> what the hell? Like Shelby, come on, get over here, come on. She's just looking at me like no like fuck you like I, I i ain't doing what you want <laughs> and i was like what the fuck like this little four-week-old bitch won't listen to me like what the hell what the hell's happening i've never seen a dog not you know not uh, not a uh, leash that's what i'm looking for not not you know obey a leash most dogs actually love it they love walking out and she enjoyed walking with me but that leash she she refused and uh so i did a little bit of digging and it turns out that some big dogs actually have issues with leashes and it's Basically, it has to be a battle of wills. So that's when we had our very first battle of wills. <laughs> um, I ended up winning, obviously, because it, it, it's a grown-ass man against a puppy. But basically, it's, it was every single time it was a struggle fighting to get her to listen to the leash, the leash, the leash. Eventually, she relented. and um, uh, But but I, I just, I'll never forget that look, that defiant look of like, no, fuck you. Like, no, I'm no, like telling you, classic Sundere. <laughs> classic sundere that uh i managed to break her managed to break her and all this time uh wh- whenever she was trying to fall asleep by the way big big tip for you guys when you're training a puppy um treat the dog the way that you want it to behave when they're older and so shelby i knew that she was going to be a big dog and so i i rarely ever picked her up and had her on my lap I knew that was a bad thing. I rarely, I, I, I let her, you know, put her head on my lap and stuff like that. But I rarely ever picked her up. And when she, you know, tried to put her paws on me, I'd be like, no, down. Fortunately, I never really had that issue. She was very much into her own space. She was very independent, extremely independent. She liked her own space. She'd hang out with you. She'd hang out with you in the same room. And, uh, but whenever she wanted to go to bed, she'd be like, all right, deuces, I'm going to bed. And she'd just leave. <laughs> which is weird other dogs want to be with you every single second uh like the the male dog that i have if i'm sitting down he'll he'll go and he'll put his head on my lap and then he'll put his chin on my lap and then a paw and then he'll sneak in the other paw and then the torso and then the second paw. and all the time he's probably going like haha i'm so sneaky he can't realize that i'm coming on shelby was not like that shelby was like i'll just sit next to you we'll hang out I'm I'm perfectly happy hanging out. When she wanted attention, she demanded it, and it was pretty easy for her to get it. But most of the time, she was like, I'm just cool hanging out. She was very independent, pretty much did what she wanted <laughs> all the time. That's the type of dog she was. Anyway, back to this. So as I'm prepping her, when whenever I, I, I saw that she was falling asleep and, well, that I got to catch that moment, I, I would stroke her, and I would sing a song for her because dog consistency helps with, with whenever you're training anything and so the i always try to sing the same song so i either sang stellar by incubus or the killers that just land fairy tale um to to while while she was starting to fall asleep and for those of you who don't know that one that's um a dust land fairy tale beginning just another wine so it's it's easy to sing a cappella. anyway 
So that's that's what I did, and uh, then the day for the road trip come. And by this point, nobody in my family knows that I have a dog. And I mean nobody. So I was worried about the reception that we were going to get at home. Uh, but I figured, you know what? If I come here with it already, then what can they do about it? You know, it's what are they going to do? Just going to throw the dog in the trash? I don't think so. Plus, I'll defend this pup to death. So <laughs> uh, the first test, fortunately, I had would be my sister. So I start the 10-hour road trip. And in this 10-hour road trip, we had, again, with a seven-week-old puppy, six, seven-week-old puppy, we had a, and a total number of zero accidents. Zero accidents. Why? Because at that point, um, she was, again, she was kind of a lazy dog, and she liked hanging out. And so she was fine with just hanging out in the car while we, while we were driving. She just lay there every once in a while. She when I, I gave her a teddy bear so she would just bite on the teddy bear. And every once in a while she would she would put her hand uh her face on my hand and kind of start biting a little bit. And to me that was the cue that she wanted to go pee. So I would stop the car, let her out, she would pee, poop or if she wanted to, and then we'd go back in. So to me I was I was shocked, like shocked. Uh, if you remember, six months, uh, until six months, the brain's finished developing. This should not be happening. A dog actually giving you a signal that they need to do something. This is not normal. This is not ordinary. And the first time could have been a coincidence. Uh, it could have been just random. She did it again and again because puppies need to pee every two, three hours. Every single time she did the same thing, just bite my hand a little bit, just a little, just a little nibble, but it wasn't the normal playful nibble. It was like, a, like I need this. And so I would stop. I would let her out. It would, she would go. And then we'd go right back in the car. Never complained about, well, never like cried, never got stir crazy, never nothing. It was perfect. She was perfect. And we were by that point, perfectly in sync. And I mean perfectly in sync. We understood each other almost completely. And again, a puppy. Not a big dog yet. Not a fully developed dog. Not a fully developed brain. And we were perfectly in sync. So we make it Monterey. Pick up my sister. and Well, didn't pick up. We, we stayed there a few days. And she was ecstatic, to say the least. Because she was a beautiful dog. She was a beautiful pup. She looked like a tiny little polar bear back then. And she was super like, oh, my God, it's so cute. Like, what are we going to do with my dad? I don't know. But he said he didn't want any more dogs. But I'm coming with one. I don't care. <laughs> and we had some adventures there in Monterey. doesn't matter. And then we drove all the way from Monterey to San Diego. Now, let me just see exactly what the what the distance is from from there. Because we went through Texas. Um, 28 hours. <laughs> So, well, tw- no, let me see, 22 hours, all right? So, from Monterey, we crossed over to the United States to Loretto, Texas. And from there, we went all the way to San Diego. It's all the way. 22 hours, well, well, 23 hours, actually, here. And I'm guessing that's with the traffic right now. So, it was probably more back then. So, almost, uh, almost 24 hours in the car, again, with a seven-week-old puppy. Again, we had absolutely zero accidents. Again, every single time she did the exact same thing, she would go nibble on my hand in a way that I understood she had to go pee. Every single time. When she was hungry, she would nibble at me in a different way. When she was thirsty, she would nibble at me in a different way. My point is we understood each other. And it could be that the dog was really smart, or it could be that I'm an obsessive, crazy person. (laughs) Both things, or it could be both. But the point is, we worked. And so, drove all the way back to San Diego, then crossed over to to Mexico. Actually, the crossing of the border was kind of interesting because, ah, (laughs) allegedly, um, the dog needed a certain type of papers in order to cross the border. So, I went to a vet, and the vet, you know, gave me the paperwork that I said. But, unfortunately, she was sick. So, she got sick about a few... um, a few days after I got her, it was an infection thing. It's probably because, you know, she was in a ranch and stuff like that. The different type of care. And so that, um, 
the the vet could not give me a certificate of health. If you're crossing over a puppy to the United States, or I don't know if now, but back then you need a certificate of health for certain days, and I couldn't get it because she had just she had just taken medication and stuff like that. And so we were like, "Fuck! How the hell are we gonna cross this?" So what I did was I. Uh, my, my my truck was packed to the rim, and I mean to the top with stuff. Like, I, I put a camper on the back of my truck, and it was filled with stuff between my stuff coming back from Guadalajara and my sister's stuff from Monterey. So it was packed to the brim. And I told her, all right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to write a list where we list absolutely every single thing in the truck, and somewhere there in the middle, I'm going to put American Akita <laughs> and... Well, you'll just have her, you know, it was really cold. It was extremely cold. If you've ever been to Texas, it's really cold in winter. And so you'll just have her in a blanket in your arms. And if he notices, he notices. If not, maybe it'll look like a teddy bear. Maybe it'll maybe it'll look like just like something or, or maybe just look like a blanket. But we'll see. We'll play it by ear. And legally, we did disclose it because I will give him the sheet listing every single thing that was in that car. And so... We get to the border. Uh, the agent starts asking us a whole... Like, I show him the list and he finds it funny. So he starts asking us some questions about like, oh, where are you from? Like, oh, we're crossing over to San Diego. Like, oh, really? What part? Like, oh, this part. So we have a little bit of a conversation. And uh, then just like, all right, okay. Well, let me just look at the truck a little quick. He comes back to the front and, uh, and he gives her back her paperwork. And uh, then he just points a pen out at my sister and like, you have the papers for the dog <laughs> and my heart sank to my stomach my i i could feel like my jaw almost dropping to the floor i tried to keep it cool but i was like mm. and i was like yeah because i did have papers i just did not have the particular certificate we needed but i had her you know like her vaccination like oh yeah i'm like oh yeah whatever just you know go ahead and we were like yes <laughs> we we beat the law allegedly allegedly this is all allegedly but uh <laughs> He let us through, and uh, we just you know gunned it out of there. So we got lucky. We got like, or we got we worried over nothing because I mean, who as long as the dog looked healthy, I guess it was fine. But um, yeah, it doesn't matter. None of that matters. The point is we crossed over, and so we make it all the way to TJ, and we arrive at our house, and my dad's not there. So. We were like, okay, how are we going to do this? Uh, should I give him a warning beforehand? I, I showed it to my mom. I was like, oh, my God. Like, like, I don't know how your dad's going to take this. And I was like, Ugh, I'll, I'm willing to deal with the consequences. I've always been a consequence guy. I don't care. Like, I'll, I'll take a risk. and I'll deal with the consequences. It's fine. But uh, I, I'm, I remember we're just sitting there at home. It's like, all right, I'm, we'll try to do the same thing with the cops. We'll just – I put her on a pillow – She'll be laying down next to us on the table. If he notices, he notices. If he doesn't, then, you know, we'll, we'll see how long he won't notice. My dad, it, I, it was pouring rain out. So my dad walks in, takes off his jacket. He's like, oh, he's happy to see my sister, happy to see me, hugs us. And uh, I'm going to say this in Spanish because this, this is how he said it. He looks at her, like his eyes light up, and he's like, ¿Quién es esta pendeja? <laughs> so basically, he's like, Who's this idiot? <laughs> who's who's this dummy? And, but but with with uh, an excited tune, you know, like the, oh, who's this? Who's this? And he just goes for her, grabs her, picks her up. Love at first sight too. Love at first fucking sight. And honestly, I don't really even remember if we even had a conversation about it. I I I, I for I maybe I blacked out, or maybe I was so happy that he was happy. But uh, I don't even remember if we had a conversation. I don't think we did. So I, I so I, it was. I guess we just, we all assumed, like, if we're not talking about it, that means she's staying. <laughs> and my dad's pretty excited about it. So she stayed home. And from that point on, she was the queen of the house. She was the, the absolute queen of the house. Um, she, had, she had the run of the place. The other dogs were outside. She was inside. She shed like crazy. Her, do her hair shed like crazy. And still, she was inside the house because she was such a, you could trust her with anything. You didn't have to worry about her chewing on stuff. You didn't have to worry about getting where she didn't have to go. Uh, you didn't have to worry. Kids could be around you. you I, we never had to worry about anything with Shelby. She was always, always a good girl. She was always happy to hang out or always happy to do her own thing. She was, she basically, you know, you get what you earned. She earned it, right? She listened, uh, she listened to you when you, when you gave her an order or something, but she kind of fought you on it sometimes. Like, for example, like she's in my bed. 
and I have to take her out because we're about to leave the house. And and she can't stay inside because we want her to be outside and protect the house. And also, if she moved around, she might set off the alarms and stuff. But um, it's like, uh, Shelby, come, come, we got to go outside. She would lift her head up and look at and give you this look. It's like, seriously? Seriously? <laughs> you're like, all right, come on. Then, then it's not a joke. Come on. And then she would begrudgingly, like, get up. You know, like, you can see, like, it, body language, like, ugh, fine, I'll do it. Jesus Christ, you're so annoying. <laughs> So, like I said, that that dog could practically talk, and so she 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 had to run to the house, and I'm I guess this is the point where I jump into Friday. So last Friday, ten years, jumping ten years, uh, we had we had a lot of stuff, and I mean great stuff happened through those ten years. But I'm not gonna go through her whole life like this. This those memories are for me and for me alone. Well, I mean also my family who were there, but. They were for me alone. And I'll, I guess I'll share a few of them in, in the meantime. But uh, last Friday, I was working at the station. We just finished out the show. We just finished out recording the P1 podcast. I had to stay in the studio because I needed to load a whole bunch of stuff. Friday's busy day for me, especially now that the crew is operating from, from the Papani studios, from quarantine studios. And I was finishing up stuff, and I got a call from my dad. And my dad was telling me, like, hey, I'm on the way to the vet because Shelby, she was uh, she was kind of crying over the night. Like, uh, there was something wrong with her. Like, something was bothering her stomach. So I'm taking her to the vet. Just want to let you know. Um, he told me that he she'd eaten the night before, or about well, the day before. Then she drank water. She walked around. She, she kind of drive heaved a little. So I figured, okay, she probably just, it's not a big, the, the big, the big red flag with dogs is when they don't eat. And so... Uh, he, he gave me the heads up, like, all right, okay, cool, let me know what happens. And so I kept working, and a few, like, 10, 20 minutes later, I guess, I get another call from my dad, and he is unintelligible. Like, I cannot understand a word that he's saying, saying, because he's bawling. And I I took that as a bad sign. Uh, but eventually, he kind of composed himself a little, and he tells me that when they got there, she was dead. So as soon as he got to the to the vet's office, she was already gone, and so that that moment it was it was a bit of a shock to me. But I throughout you know throughout life you you lose people you you learn how a little a little bit about mourning and stuff like that. And so what I've always done when I lose somebody is I try to repeat. So like I was shocked a little bit, and so I've tried to repeat a certain thing to myself whenever I'm in that situation. I don't know if it's the healthiest thing. I don't know if it's an unhealthy thing. But to me, it's, uh, you know, the five stages of grie- of grieving. The, well, the last one is acceptance. So I figured if you just jump to acceptance, things will be easier. So what I did was as soon as he said that, I was a little bit in shock. I, I was not sure what to say. Like what happened was not real. The, the symptoms that he told me was not real. He didn't really sound uber concerned. I mean, he called me because she was an older dog and, if she required surgery or something, that there's consequences for that. There's consequences for anesthesia and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, that's 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 why he called me and to give me kind of like a heads up, and it wouldn't come out of nowhere. But it came out of nowhere for him too. He got there and she wasn't she wasn't and she was moving like she he he helped her to the bed of the truck, but she moved. She she laid out on on her towel or something, so she still was operational. Uh, when he stopped by to get gas, she was still there. And so it, it it completely shocked him. It happened really quickly. And uh, so he called me. And uh, I'm quiet there for, for a few seconds. And so I, I just I repeat this thing to myself. Like, okay, she's dead. Shelby's dead. I love her and she's dead. I love her and she's dead. And that kind of helped ground me a little bit. Because it, it brings two things to mind. First off, that bo- both of those things could be real at the same time. Like she could, she could, yes, it's the fact that she's dead, but yes, I still love her. Like her state of being does not change that, right? The fact that she's, I love her dead. I love her alive. It, that does not change. It hurts, but that doesn't change. So that's what, that's why I say that. Cause I need to, I need to ground myself a little. It's like, okay, the love's still there. Even if she isn't, if that makes any sense. I don't know. It makes me feel better. It helps me gain focus at that point. So I just ask him, all right, well, what are they going to do with her? And he says, all right, they're going to come by, pick her up to cremate her. And I asked, all right, could you ask them to wait a little bit for me? He asked how much time I need. 
And I say, do you think you could be an hour? Like an hour. Because I have to finish off things at the studio. I need to finish off work. Then the time that it takes me to drive to the border. And then the, the time it would take me to cross over. Like I, I, I was giving myself an hour. I knew I could do it faster. But I, I wanted to shoot. I wanted to at least make sure for an hour. She'd be fine. She'd be there. And uh, my uh, my dad's like, all right, I'll make sure that she's still here. I was like, okay. If she if he would have said no, if they would have said no, if they're coming in here in like 10 minutes, I would have just dropped everything right then and there and, and gone. But uh, that gave me time to, you know, to like, keep my brain busy with work, finish things out there. And that way I wouldn't have to be worrying about, oh, I left this unfinished at the st- or something. I was like, okay, I could, then I could just completely focus my mind on what was going on. So I, I finished work there. I start driving down Mexico and the drive there is brutal brutal because uh you're driving your months your mind starts wandering and uh feelings start hitting you and i have no longer any reason to compose myself because i'm not at work anymore and so the the drive there was hard it was really hard and i just kept i kept thinking uh you know it's it's funny humans we immediately want to go to regret and i don't like i i I kept arguing with myself it's like uh I, I, i wanted to kick myself for not being there you know it could really like kick myself because I I remember when uh, when she had her her puppies you know uh, the what what we did was uh, she was her first batch of puppies she was kind of confused she did not understand what was happening with her body so I set up a camping tent in the backyard and basically uh, I just I was in there with her the whole time the whole night she was scared and confused and so I made her feel better you know made her feel like she was safe and uh, actually ended up saving one of the puppies because uh one of the very first one when he came out um she she tried to you know open up the 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 bag that they come in and she she cut off the umbilical cord without actually opening up the bag properly and so the 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 puppy could not breathe and she could not reach him because it when she moved the puppy it was in an odd angle and she couldn't reach him and uh so I had to get my hand in there to to put her in to put the puppy in a position where she could lick and lick the the bag clean and stuff like that. So it was better than it was and she wanted me there. Like whenever I was about to, well, whenever I walked out to go to the restroom or something or to get something, like uh, when it started getting dark, darker, I went out to get a lamp and a sleeping bag and stuff like that. Uh, she would whine the whole time because she wanted me there, and uh, so. The whole drive, I'm kicking myself that I wasn't there for her. You know, she was probably scared out of her mind, confused, and I wasn't there for her. Then, um, you know, I, you have to rationalize certain things. Like, it was killing me that I was not there for her. Then I start thinking, all right, okay, this, first off, if if I was not going to be there, the best person who could have been there was my dad. Like, if if I'm number one, my dad's clearly number two. He loved her just as much as I did. She loved him right back. But uh, so it, so my dad was there. So she wasn't alone. She did not die alone. And also, it's I realized it was very selfish because she she went pretty quick, and I mean really quick. And the and the time that it took to drive from uh from the house to to well actually closer from from the gas station to to the vet, it was it's it's not that big of a distance. And so it's it's better that she went quick, quick and painless, or is better than I don't know. She would have, if I would have gotten the call from my dad saying like if she's uh she's not she's not good. Come here now, and then I would have rushed there. It would have been what twenty thirty minutes if I'm lucky, and if I break every single law, <laughs> and I would not have given a fuck. But uh, it's thirty minutes, and that means that she would have been suffering for at least thirty minutes, and just for what for me to to feel better. That's that seemed kind of selfish and. That so so it's it's a it's a conflict of those in, of of those emotions. But uh, anyway, I make it there. Um, it's weird because uh, I I meet my dad because my 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 dad's business is a uh, it's a is like half a block there from from where the vet from the vet's house, and so I I stop by there at the business, and uh, it's weird because we are not supposed to hug right now. But uh, and so we didn't. <laughs> it it was just kind of like an awkward thing. Like I, I kind of want to, but but we're not supposed to. Whatever. But afterwards, my mom did not give a fuck. Like she just straight up hugged me. But uh, doesn't matter. That that really doesn't matter. Um. So we we walk over to the vet, 
and he's like, all right, okay, we, they they put a bag on her, you know, so that the sun wouldn't be hit her. She she was they laid her down on the yard in front, and uh, so that I could say goodbye. So I see her lying there. I start petting her. She was still kind of warm. Uh, fortunately, she she did not look like in shock and pain. She she looked kind of peaceful, which is good. I mean, nobody really looks good dead, but um, she looked the like. You, you ever seen somebody who dies in horrible pain? You can see it in their face. She did not really look that way. Um, her body was mostly relaxed. It looked like she was just laying down. So, again, that, that gave me a little bit of peace of mind. So, at, at this point, I'm bawling. And uh, I asked my dad for a few minutes. And so, I, I, I try to gather myself as much as I can. And in private, I managed to sing her a Dustland fairy tale one last time. You know, her lullaby, the song that I... That I always sang when she was scared. The song that I wanted to, that they sang to her when she was scared having babies. The song that I, I sang to her when she was a baby, her lullaby, to help her relax, to help her calm down, to help her sleep. So, I did that. I, I managed to get it out. It was hard, but I did it. And so afterwards, my dad came back, I said my goodbyes, covered her up, and uh, that's it. So, that's that's the last time I laid eyes on her. So. There you have it. <laughs> the first time and the last time I laid eyes on her. The living being that I, you know, loved in the most pure fashion that I know of. Because, you know, with people, sometimes they piss you off. Family members, they piss you off. You might you might love humans more fiercely or whatever, but there's always a part of you that's like, oh, what if they'll hurt me? No, with, with pets, it's, it's just pure. It's clean. And uh, I loved her the most. She was my favorite. We were in sync. We understood each other. Um... And it sucked because afterwards, you know, I, I go back home to check on my other dogs. And um, it's one of one of the dogs. She looks freakishly like her. She's she's a little bit more orange, a little bit more golden, but just, you know, just as pretty as her mom. And it's like you're not the same. It's, it, it, it hurts to look at her from a distance because sometimes it's like, oh, damn it, it's not her. And, uh, you know, when, when I go to bed, when I used to, well, at my parents' house, she would, we'd had our system. Um, I lay down. I'm on the side, and she sleeps behind my legs. Well, she slept behind my legs. That's how we've done it for years, always. She, if I would turn to one side, she would go to the other side. We would always sleep. She would always sleep behind my legs, except when I was sad. When I was sad, like I remember, like the last time that happened was when I lost my nana. That I was just, again, I'm a very much a suffering private person, except with Shelby. Shelby was there. She made me feel better. And so when when I was sad, she would actually lay on my torso so I could hug her. And uh, I, just, I had nobody to hug this time. So I just I kind of I, I had to go back to the U.S. anyway, because I hadn't fed Doc, Dark Star, you know, my now monitor. I had to feed him. And I was like, all right, I just I don't want to be in this bed without her right now. It's uh, it's just it's it's making me feel worse. And uh, I came back to the States and uh, after a couple of days of just trying to keep my brain busy and it sporadically because what happens with morning it's a funny thing it'll hit you randomly it's like the r- most random thing the most random people just hit you like the when it hits me the most for some reason is either when i'm driving which is not safe or when i'm in the shower it just hits you out of nowhere and so it's all right okay now it's time for me to to get it out it took me like this podcast right now it's 53 minutes it took me way longer than recorded because i have to pause several times i have to say things again You'll notice it's kind of choppy because um, uh, let's just say that it wasn't understandable the way I said it or I need to collect myself and I, I just cut all that stuff out. But yeah, that's that's the story of my baby. The first time we met, first time I laid eyes on her and the last time. And uh, well, what can I say? Well, you know what? Uh, I think I said it best on the post I did on Instagram, which is it's weird. I, and the reason why I did that actually is because I was getting messages from people and uh, well, Again, she was a very beloved dog, and more importantly, people knew how much I loved her, what she meant to me, and so it was like, okay, I just need to put it out there how I'm feeling, and uh, I think people understand what I lost, so I put it in writing how I felt and what she was to me, so I can't say it. Honestly, I've gone through that post again, and it was really hard to to write it down, but uh, it's there. It's there. It's, it, I made it real. <laughs> it's weird. It's, it, <sighs> she was my most beloved treasure. And I am extremely thankful that I got her for a decade. 
that she was mine and I was hers and that she was a part of my life and and that we were fated to be together because there was too many things, too many coincidences for it not to have been. And whenever anybody asked me, like, dude, do you regret waste? Like, when, when I... Yes, yeah, so it took me like 10 years to finally finish school because I kept moving and stuff like that and there were complications and all that stuff. Every single second of that was worth it because those 10 years were the years that I had her. And it was worth it. Every single thing that looked like a mistake led me to her. And it was worth it. So there you go. I I hope you have something or someone in your life that you love as much. And uh, give them a big hug. Enjoy them as much as you can. And... Uh, value each and every moment and each and every memory because they're precious and they're important and that's it i'm done thank you for listening to her story hopefully you know it's not just a picture anymore it's it's more of a living being and uh i don't know hopefully she'll be a little bit in your hearts as well as much as she's in mine